some old names were there when I was playing. Yeah, where where did you go? Well, I was at Utah. Uh-huh. And uh back in 72 we were independent, so we used to play a smattering of uh of teams from all over the country, especially a lot of SEC teams and and um and we had the winningest record back then for independent teams even beyond uh Notre Dame and people like that. We ended up about 14th in the nation. So we had a, we had a fun run. Oh, oh. Hold on one second. I've got your I've got your website up. Hey everybody, we're live with Robert Phoenix and Dr. Bear Paul Lando uh, talking sports as I knew they would, um, and that will be really fun to dive in today. I want to hit uh, record and start the podcast if that's cool with you, gentlemen, and respect your time, Robert. Today, uh, so here we go. Be a fun one. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time. I've actually known about your work, Robert, since probably 2015. Uh, we have a lot of, um, like we were saying before we, we went live, a lot of similarities here and synchronicities in terms of people we know and all that. So, and we have a lot of people in our community that follow you, uh, are part of, take your courses, you know, and are diehard fans. So, uh, it'll be cool to see the crossover between our communities as we now finally connected. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, gentlemen, uh, because I have a lot of respect for the Alpha Vedic world and your community. So, you know, and I, and I do know, you know, the uh, some of the people who, who are involved in this cross pollination, and they're just really cool people. And I love the fact that you guys seem to embody the best of California, right? <laughs> L- like tech innovation, um, eclectic, uh, independent but not like overly rigid, right? To me, that's that that's really my experience of growing up in California. You know, it was much more libertarian in a lot of ways. Um, and then it really uh, got very ugly. And I'm, I'm just trying to think of when it really got ugly. I, I, I would say it was probably uh, the whole thing with Dan White and Harvey Weinstein and then Jonestown, that period in the 80s, it's just a, it's a, like, what was it, 79, I think? And it starts to initiate a really dark time. Uh, and Feinstein becomes the, uh, the the mayor and then eventually matriculates into Willie Brown. And then that whole, like, weird cesspool of political influence that Kamala Harris comes out of. Yep. So I think it's that period with the 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 milk and moscone murder uh the jonestown thing which happens what like the same week i mean it's really crazy that confluence of events and we and need to that, save this for the podcast i gotta hit record robert <laughs> this is oh, crazy okay. um, oh you haven't hit record yet no <laughs> i was like okay <laughs> let me hit record and do the intro um and yes uh that is all i'd love to talk more about that because um that was some juicy good stuff here we go And boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here as always with the gracious Dr. Bear Paul Lando coming to you live and direct from the great state of Jefferson, where freedom still reigns supreme. Up here, uh, the old man is snoring. It is a pouring, and it's looking like we're going to have rain for the next 10 days, Bear. I was hoping to get a couple days of surf in uh, before I go back up. uh, I was hoping you wouldn't hear my snoring. I had myself on mute, but... Sorry about that. <laughs> you have amazing power to bring the rain, I guess, man. Um, good to know. Good to know that should come in handy during the summer. Uh, but uh, yeah, we have had actually some hard frost multiple days in a row, waking up to mid twenties here, uh, which is not normal. And I, I know Bear, that's uh, been fun for you guys probably up there at the farm. That means you have to manage your carbon footprint a little bit more efficiently, Mike. <laughs> no burning wood in California anymore. Uh, we don't play by those rules, of course. <laughs> we'll burn all the wood we want. Um, I'm excited for today's guest, uh, very much so. Robert Phoenix joins us. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and um, I I foresee this being a regular guest for sure on the on Alpha Cast to come. Real quick, just uh, some some uh, in-house uh, updates. Our, li- our um, 
private community platform is now live. We've talked about it for what, a year bear on every podcast. It's live. Go to alphavedic.com, join the community. You can join for as little as uh, five bucks, I believe, or even less as a basic supporter. You can come on as a co-op member and have all the access you want or an executive co-op member and not only get discounts on products, but join us on our live uh, Zoom calls every month and be able to direct message Bear and all that good stuff. Uh, it's already on fire in there. The conversations are amazing. The solutions are flowing and uh, it's what we've what we why we've worked so hard over the years to create. So alphavedic.com, uh, we're sharing tons of uh, workshops in there and all sorts of premium content you can't get anywhere else. Plus, YouTube has literally taken down, I think, four or five of our old alpha casts in the last week. They're not shelling out strikes anymore, which is interesting. They're just taking it all down. Uh, so you definitely want to join our platform to make sure you can get all the content. Uh, that's all I got. They're Anything else to add down here? Almost. Yeah, I was just going to say they're taking stuff down almost uh, daily. It's uh, breathtaking, which means uh, they're about to make another big move, which is what we're going to talk about today. So why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce Robert properly here? Very good. On this episode, we delve further into our investigation of the sky clock with Robert Phoenix, a practicing uh, astrologer since 2008. Prior to that, during the 90s, he was a tarot reader psychic in between stints with music, journalism, and dot comery were all part of his life. In 2013, Robert's 11th house series debuted on Gaia TV. Uh, he produ produced and hosted 25 episodes of Cutting Edge Mundane Astrology. To this day, it's still some of the most popular content on Gaia. He currently curates the 11th house on YouTube, where he produces and hosts the Astro Weather Show, uh, his new show, Serious Sports, which is really cool, uh, the Friday Farcast, and of course, Sunday Night Astro Live, which is always kicking great, um, great people in that chat. Uh, and 15 Minutes of Flame is another one currently on Boxcast TV. Uh, it's Tuesday through Thursday at 9.11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, Robert is in the hill country of Texas now. Um, in addition to these alt, me uh, alt media productions, Robert also gives personal readings for clients through his website, robertphoenix.com, which I understand, Bear, you uh, were on and have signed up for his course. Is that correct? I have, uh, much to Robert's chagrin, but I'll try not to create too much problem on the back end as a student. Uh, Robert, so good to have you here today, and uh, it, I'm really looking to forward to that course. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's great to be here. And thank you for having me on. Um, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. And before we hit record, uh, you know, one of the things I was talking about is how you seem to embody the best of California. You know, the California that I, I remember growing up in, which was, you know, for all intents and purposes, really libertarian. And, you know, if you had a different point of view, it was okay. You know, you could, you know, table it, talk about it, and not take it personally. I I grew up for the most part in San Jose, California, which at that time was probably about as ethnically diverse as a place that you could find um, in the United States. So, you know, my classmates were black, Mexican, Filipino, Japanese, Chinese. And then towards the end of my high school year, we had a new influx of uh, people coming from uh, Iran, uh, Korea, and, and we all, you know, it's just a really interesting memory because we all got along. You know, we all, you know, it, it didn't mean that there weren't occasional problems because, you know, occasionally there were, we're humans, but we all got along and we went to each other's parties and, you know, we, you know, I, I hung out with just about everybody in high school. And to me, that is also like the best part of California. You know, it, it's it's like the truly the the manifestation of the melting pot of the American dream. And everything just kind of, you know, moves westward and kind of, you know, empties out into the Pacific. And it was a great time to be there. The music was great. You know, tech really comes online uh, during the 90s. And, you know, you've got a lot, a lot of like kind of old cybernetic libertarian warriors like John Perry Barlow and. Um, you know, uh, Stuart Brand and, you know, uh, Dvorak, all these guys are, you know, build, building the infrastructure 
that we're, you know, participating in now. And there was a great feeling, uh, you know, I don't know where you guys were, Barry, I don't know where you were in the 90s, but towards the, like from 96 on till, till, till the, till 2000, there was this really interesting vibe taking place in the Bay Area. I was working at this magazine called Mondo 2000, which was this kind of cutting edge cyber zine. When I say cyber, I mean, like it was about cyber culture, not that it was online. Um, and I was there kind of during the last gasp of the magazine, but I was witnessing this fascinating confluence of technology, the beginning of the web, um, technology coming into music and sampling. And when you get it, and the, the barrier has always been very multi culty So it, it wasn't just, you know, computer technology and sampling, but you had various music from around the world. I was, you know, I was in the music community at that time. And some of the people I knew were from places like Nigeria, uh, you know, Iran. And it was all really kind of coming together in a very interesting way. There was all this dot-com fluff, and, and that was kind of fueling it and powering it. And I really felt like we're kind of on the precipice of what started off in the 60s and got really dark. You know, like the 90s were the 60s reverse, right, in some ways. And, and this is kind of the culmination, like... A lot, you know, a lot of the the sort of the boomers and the hippies were were growing up, moving into maturity, starting companies. A lot of them had, for the most part, you know, decent intentions. I remember interviewing Paul Hawken during that time. Uh, of course, you know, Smith and Hawken and the Hawken Company. And it was it was like okay, here we go. It's like this kind of fulfillment of these nascent dreams of the '60s with this overlay of astrology. And then we were talking about Terrence McKenna um, before we hit record. And then you had sort of the psychedelic piece that was coming into play as well. So it was all really frothy and heady and felt like, man, we could create something really new here. And perhaps there was a bit of naivete uh, on my part, but you know, once Bush you know, took power in 2000, everything got very, very dark. Not to say that it wasn't dark during Clinton, but it was almost as if the Clinton sphere was operating sort of independently in some ways of what we were experiencing in the Bay Area. And then we were talking earlier about when the Bay Area um, kind of did go dark. This is apart from what I was talking about with uh, this interesting kind of, we'll call it the cyber rush instead of the gold rush. But, um, you know, when Moscone and Milk got killed, under really weird circumstances with Dan White, the white knight. And then you have Jonestown happening, I think the same week. D that period be to me signals the, the political change that's going to take place in the Bay area. And you have Feinstein becoming mayor and that ultimately leads to Willie Brown. And it's through Willie Brown. Uh, like I did a whole deep dive on the creation of Willie Brown and the creation of this you know, kind of, what would I call it? Like a three-headed beast with San Francisco politics because Willie Brown would focus on getting the populist vote. Like, so they figured out, like, we need to get these fringe communities to vote for our policies, right? We need to politicize the fringe communities. And that time it was in the Castro, uh, on, in and around Polk Street, to some degree, Chinatown, uh, the Western Edition, uh, the uh, area out by Candlestick. So this what what they did in San Francisco really post they started they started with Moscone, but it really ramped up during the Feinstein and post Feinstein years was figuring out how to get special interest groups involved in local politics so that they could become a voting block and a voting force. But what may, and this is really in some ways what we're also seeing with the Biden administration, they they were using those people as assets to stay in power, but they were really hardcore corporatists. Like Willie Brown was this huge commercial growth guy. And so they're cutting deals on the side with all these developers, but what they're but they're feeling that by appealing to these fringe voting blocks. And it's kind of the model that's been carried forward into what we're witnessing now. And Kamala Harris is the link because Kamala Harris was, of course, 
um, mentored by Willie Brown. And when you get into Kamala Harris's past, mentored, mentored, yes, um, yeah, I I was under the impression that she uh, earned her political stripes by servicing Willie Brown's um, office. Should we say? Well, there is that too, <laughs> but Willie Brown knew how to. Willie Brown was a master uh, organizer. And he was very good at getting the opposition party to do what he wanted them to do. So Willie Brown was like the consummate deal maker in a lot of ways. And so she learned some things from him in that regard. But it's fascinating watching her. If you go back and look at her emergence, right? She's a DA in Oakland. And then she connects with Willie Brown and becomes his paramour. And then she starts showing up in all of these like Pacific Heights parties she's in the social pages of the chronicle like every other week she's being featured in the chronicle and it's almost as if they adopt her as like you know oh here's here's this you know beautiful young black woman that we can you know wrap our arms around and champion and oh aren't we so progressive right like that's where she really gets her start and then she runs for uh da against terrence hallinan and she she'd been an assistant with Terrence Hallinan, like she she worked under him. And then what she did is she she had access to a lot of his dirt, and she used that dirt politically uh, to go after him. And so this is really the beginning of the dark phase of of that time in the Bay Area, where there seems to be this really seismic power shift. And by the time we get into the two thousands. Um, you know, the train has left the station, right? And and, and any semblance of any, and it's really weird, right? Because you look back, even somebody like Jerry Brown, who would theoretically fit the, the label of being a progressive, when Jerry Brown was governor of California, he balanced the budget. I mean, he was a freaking cheapskate, right? Jerry Brown was, was, he was proud. I mean, the guy, what did he, he drove a Volkswagen or whatever, right? I mean, he had that, that kind of, Jesuit, uh, monk-like um, uh, yeah. sort of indoctrination. I sat, in, I sat in coach on a flight with Jerry Brown next to him one time because his famous thing is he always took coach regular commercial flights. So that's uh, sorry. Anyway, right, no, I but got that, to I chat mean, with him a little bit, and that was way but, back. Moon beaming. Yeah, he, he, I that mean, was before he earned that moniker, oh. he so he was a guy that actually practiced what he preached, right? So even then, you know, when you look at somebody like Jerry Brown, he was a progressive in terms of his social policies, and he was very conservative in terms of his fiscal policies. So there's a there's been a major sea change in in that area as well, and of course, out of that period emerges Gavin Newsom, gruesome Newsom, who was very dark, and and it's during the '90s where um, he was uh, a soup from uh, what down by the marina wasn't that his district very down in the marina that was his I, I think so i think so yeah so yeah i mean that's where, really where there's this dark turn that takes place well, of course newsom is a uh, nephew of nancy and nancy is the daughter of the baltimore crime boss so it's like right know, I was going to say Newsom, Brown, sketchy. Pelosi, and Feinstein are all interrelated is four original families that go back to 1920s mobsters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And when you really dive into Diane Feinstein and look at the uh, not just the political influence, but the real estate power that she and her husband, Richard Bloom, had in not just in San Francisco, but the Bay Area, like they wound up in possession of that Numi plant down in uh, down in Hayward which eventually became the Solyndra plant right and that was that was a that was a big money washing scheme uh with these uh you know, these, these this whole solar thing and uh, any anyway the you're right I mean these families are crime families and when you go deep enough into all of them they're all basically organized syndicate crime families I mean that's what we're dealing with here and they're dressed up in mm -hmm. suits and and in you know, ball gowns and uh, political affiliation. It's, it's all just a cover.
And uh, Killary's father, uh, who was reportedly uh, owned a, an upholstery business, uh, was actually the crime boss of Chicago, took all over after Al Capone went down. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. And, you know, I really uh, share your great memories of the Bay Area. You know, I was born in San Francisco. My uh, folks were um, immigrants, so I was born in Little Italy in North Beach, you know, back when I was 100% Italian. But it was a very tolerant place in, in the best of ways, not in a new uh, woke uh, kind of way. Because, uh, you know, Italians uh, back then elsewhere in the country were were really looked down upon. And in fact, in uh, some places in the South, they were <laughs> considered lower than black people. And But, you know, San Francisco was a place uh, of great tolerance. And if you think about the historical migration to the West Coast, it started with the gold rush, and it really attracted those sort of adventurous free spirits that wanted to uh, have a measure of sovereignty and control over their own lives. That's why they moved to the West Coast. Now, you you were describing that time period uh, right around the 80s, and Deb and I, my wife, we were both born in a well born in San Francisco, but raised in Marin County. We were out in West Marin, which is kind of rural. And we were getting inundated with people moving in, uh, you know, with the influx of the 60s and, and early 70s from people all over the country. So now the folks that are being demonized, uh, you know, in places like Idaho, Texas, and Tennessee, where all these Californians are moving in, well, they aren't real Californians. Those are the ones that invaded us back you know, way back then. And in fact, it changed so substantially that we decided to get out of Dodge and we uh, moved to Fiji and then uh, quickly moved to Hawaii after that to raise our family. So I missed that whole 80s, 90s period in uh, California because as far as we we're concerned, the Bay Area had already changed too much for our taste. Yeah, that's, that's completely understandable. Uh, it's interesting that you brought up uh, uh, Little Italy and migration, of course, APG and any started Bank America, right, which is this huge institution. And then on the other side, uh, you also have uh, the Levi family, right, during that time. So these two mm -hmm. huge American institutions come out of that period, and they're all centered around San Francisco. So um, I was telling you earlier that I had signed up for your course uh, which I'm really excited about if we can right. kind of segue into your work a little bit. And I did my chart uh, that maybe you could use me as a, uh, I'll bear my soul for the public here and, and let you maybe just do a, a cursory run through so folks can see how you, you go about that. And I just want to tell you also, Robert, the reason why I'm interested in astrology, I have been for many, many, many years but I never had any formal training, uh, nor did I ever um, have an intent to create charts or that sort of thing for people. So I didn't go there, but I needed a, a certain level of understanding of astrology that I incorporate into my farming and my laboratory techniques where I make plant medicine. And so that's that's pretty much where I'm confined uh, as far as my understanding and also more of an understanding of what's really coming down on a level of let's just say physics you know we could describe uh you know those resonant fields that come down from the constellation so i kind of look at it more from a level of uh, health and wellness and making medicine and growing things and uh, i've always wanted to get into actually sitting down learning how to do a whole chart and go through the whole thing so that's why i'm so excited about your course here so um would, do you want have any comments or would you like me to put my thing up on the screen there? And then you then we'll just uh, follow your lead from that point uh, into uh, what's going on with current events and sports and everything else. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you can you can go ahead and put your chart up. I think one of the things that um, jumped into my mind when you were talking about astrology and what would be your relationship to astrology that's really the beautiful thing about astrology is that everybody can find their angle inside of astrology. So if you wanted to look at say cycles of the moon, which are going to play a huge role in planting um, and in harvesting um, and the cycles of the season under, under uh, various uh, assignations of the sun, 
like all that stuff is very applicable through astrology. Or if you wanted to understand relationships, you if you're a relationship person, there's that with astrology. If you want to understand like the science and art of relocation, there's that with astrology, right? If you want to understand how these events impact the world, uh, it's called mundane astrology. There's that with astrology. Uh, if you want to understand how it impacts the self and the evolution of the self, there's that with astrology. There, there's so many different pieces of astrology that a person can connect into that I think it's um, really uh, a very applicable art. And these Gen Z kids are just eating it up like, like candy. And I've witnessed the growth of astrology over the last four to five years. It's just, it's just been outrageous and exponential. And it feels to me like it will take its place as I wouldn't say a belief system, but clearly an operating principle that has a lot of merit in people's lives. And I can easily see Gen Z moving this forward where it becomes much more integrated into our lives. So do you want to throw your chart back up there? Yeah, I'm trying to get it up there. Um, hang on. What I've been also loving, Robert, is this explosion in syncretism. And we've had multiple guests on here um, that you know that we've dived deep into a lot of astrology related to all aspects of mythology and religion yeah. and history. But uh, something I've been really passionate about of late is this sort of hermetic notion of as below, so above. And right. the deep reflection about, about our actual effect from our consciousness, our mental aptitude, and what you know, all is this concept of all is mental is actually directly affecting the sky clock in ways that uh, is infinite and beyond time and space. And so, um, going back, obviously, we talk a lot about as above, so below, but. Um, refocusing the empowerment notions. And I think Gen Z really gets this about so below as above as well. Right. It's, you know, it's a really fascinating uh, topic of conversation when you really get into like, uh, even on a personal level with these kind of mythological sinks. I, I had a client last week. He's a great guy and he lives in, um, he lives in Australia and he's um, going through a very rigorous program at the Jung Institute. And, and, and um, you know, we were winding down our, our reading and I was looking at his progress chart and uh, he had uh, Aquarius on his midheaven in his progress chart and Pluto creeping up on his midheaven. And I started to talk about it and I was trying to find a way to articulate it. And all of a sudden I heard this voice from the other room and it was his son. And his son was so the second, he, he broke in twice. His son is eight years old. And he was talking about how there, there was a problem with the water in the bathroom, specifically in the bathtub. And it sounded like it was, you know, one of these domestic emergencies. And he came into the room and, and talked about it again. So my client had to get up and go into the other room and then deal with the crisis. And I, and I just thought to myself, this is nuts, right? Because I'm talking about Aquarius, and Aquarius is the water bearer, yeah. Yeah. and his son walks into the room and is bringing news about the water, right? The water that's overflowing in the bathtub. And we started to talk about that. We got a good chuckle out of it. And it turns out his son is also a Pisces, right? So he really, in a lot of ways, is a water bearer because of his sun sign. And I love stuff like that, right? Like, and sometimes you have to wonder, well, am I having this really uh, kind of synchronistic moment because my client is a deep Jungian, right? You know, is, is it happening because the two of us are creating this experience together or is it just kind of a slice of reality's pie? Either way, like I love stuff like that. So to your point, Mike, that's sort of the as below part. We're experiencing that together. And creating that as part of this mini version of the sky clock in real time. Hey, Mike, I just put the uh, link to that up on the chat there. If you can get up on your end, I, I don't think it was, you were it was working at all. It was working yeah, it, fine. It was there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I was just, <laughs> I was just tripping on a story there for a minute. 
<laughs> no, okay. I love that. You know, and I couldn't what, see was it the... on my end there. So, you, you um, know, I think. Okay, hang on. I'll, I'll I'd like again. to. You know, we'll we'll evolve the conversation, but after we go through Bear's chart and uh, hear more from you, Robert. But I, this notion of how those types of sinks and it's funny uh, you think of sink like a bathroom sink too i don't know if that's where the problem was but <laughs> it was um, close it was the bathtub but it was close yeah um but are these connections becoming more rapid more conclusive more immediate more um sort of you know apparent i believe so and i believe that has to do with uh the grander cycles that maybe we'll get into today going into this quote unquote age of Aquarius and um, the way our consciousness interacts in these different ages. Yeah. I think that's extremely exciting personally. Yeah, I do too. I think, you know, we got a little taste of Pluto and Aquarius earlier this year and it was, you know, it was about as weird as it got for a couple months, right? That's when Dylan Mulvaney went on his Bud Light campaign and <laughs> And here's here's the sky clock for you right here. I can see this, by the way, Barry. Um, oh, okay, so, good. Yeah, now it's gone. <laughs> oh, okay. It, Hang on. it was there and it left. Just so, now. so if you go yep, back, I see and, it. If, if you go back and look okay. at that time when Pluto was in Aquarius, it also coincided with Pride Month, right? Which is very Aquarian in a lot of ways, like Pride Month. And there was, it's like a month, really? We're doing a whole month for Pride? And so what happened is that during Pride Month, Pluto retrograded back into Capricorn. And I'll never forget this. When it retrograded into Capricorn, Starbucks, which had been on schedule for the entire month, halfway through the month, dropped their Pride Month. It was like, oh, let's get corporate again. Let's get, let's get Capricornian again. We're losing money here. Let's, you know, and it was right really on the dot with the uh, the retrograde of Pluto back into Capricorn. It was really fascinating to watch. So when you look at that and you see that with the big sky clock, it's like, oh, yeah, there's something to this astrology thing. Um, all right. So I'm looking at your chart. And one of the reasons why we get along is because your moon in Libra is conjunct my Venus in Libra. So Moon and Libra, one of my, I also have Moon and Libra, so I'm, I'm a fan of Moon and Libra. It's pretty fair. It's a fair Moon, right? Everybody gets a fair shake with the Moon and Libra. Um, you've got it uh, towards the end. So that's in that degree in astrology. There's something called the Via Combust or the Via Combusta, which happens from like 24 Libra to I think about 13 or 14 Scorpio. It's a, it's kind of a, you know, uh, an esoteric. Uh, terminology or esoteric function. Not a lot of people really talk about it, but it's called the Via Combusta because it's called the burning path. And so any planets that are in that path uh, through that degree go through this kind of alchemical process where the uh, whatever the planet is gets sort of purified and, and transformed. And now me with Venus and Libra, I've experienced that. I've experienced that through relationship and ultimately refining the types of relationships that I would want in my life, right? And, I'm, and I've had some burning path relationships. And for you, it's emotional. And it is connected to your values and your home and how you feel about things in general. And part of it is also being fueled. And I love this because you have Mars over here uh, in Cancer. So you got a moon Mars square. And when you get into squares, what squares to me are like points of ignition in a chart, right? If you were to take, um, you know, a flint and a rock or whatever and strike them, you'd get a spark out of them. And that's what happens with squares. You know, they keep rubbing up against each other and squaring off against each other. And that ignition is really the, the impetus for fuel and for change, right? So there's a bit of a restless component to your moon Mars square as well. Right. You're trying, you're trying to find home. You've got Mars and Cancer. You're trying to find a place where your values, which is what the moon is all about, where your values can uh, be in alignment with who you are. Who you are is a Leo. Right. So you've got that Sun Pluto conjunction. So you're really intense, right? Like there's a very intense side to you. But like with any planet in the eighth house, it's not always viewable or visible. 
but hang out with you for a while and people will understand just how intense you are. And the sun in the eighth house is like the power behind the throne, which I really like with Leo here. So you're not an ostentatious Leo, right? You're not, you're not out there, um, you know, basically, you know, banging the drum and, and you know, touting your brand, you know, you, but you are a leader and you're a leader behind the scenes. And, and I think you're pretty methodical and you, and you would plan fairly deeply and intently for the most part, every now and then, I think with that moon Mars square, there's some impetuosity, but over time, right. With a square, my begin, wife would say that. Yeah. But with a square, you, you begin to refine that impetuosity Right. And so you can be emotionally impassioned without being incredibly impetuous. Right. That's the whole idea of square is you're, you're here to integrate this idea of Mars with the moon. And they're very different energies. But what's fascinating is you have uh, Mars and Cancer and the, you know, the moon is ruled by Cancer. So, you know, we're talking about a, kind of a sophisticated form of alchemy here and working out these very disparate energies. Through through these and, and Mars and, and Cancer is in its detriment. I have Mars and Cancer as well. It's very it's very loyal. Like Mars and Cancer is really loyal, and it's really good at defending things. It's not really good at like attacking things. And in fact, anybody who has Mars and Cancer, you're if you if you start a fight, and I and I know this from personal experience, if you start a fight with Mars and Cancer, there's a very good chance you'll lose. However. If you come to somebody's defense with Mars and Cancer, or you know, whether it's a, a, a person that you are friendly with, a loved one, there's a very good chance you'll carry the day because that's how Mars and Cancer works. It is not an offensive uh, energy in the chart. It is a defensive energy in the chart. And that's another part of the Moon-Mars square also is to like tame feeling defensive about things or feeling offended about things. Right. So over time, you get to tame these elements and aspects in your chart. So ultimately, the two are working, hopefully, in confluence with one another. And you also have um, some other stuff going on uh, with Mars and Jupiter. And that's and that 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 Mars Jupiter square is also not just impetuous, but it's also a, a risk taker. Right. It's like, let's roll the dice here. Let's do this. You know, let's let's go big or go home. You know, and that's 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 anytime you get a square with Jupiter, you're opening up the potentiality for risk. And and it's almost like Jupiter's goading you. Come on, come on. Why don't you try this? Why don't you try this? Put your big boy pants on, right? And then you get into it. It's like, holy shit, like what did I sign up for? It's one of those kind of interesting cosmic hooks with astrology. And and it's like it's it's almost like, okay, yeah, I'll I'll go be in this eating contest, no problem. And then they bring the plate and you're like, oh shit, right? Yeah, you, you, it's like go big or go home. You also have that Jupiter square with Uranus, which is another part of this. It's like, well, let's try this. I know it sounds wacky, but let's try this. And it's kind of like, okay, are you sure? Yeah. And you've got that Jupiter in Aries, which is fearless. And it's in the fourth house. So it's interesting that you're way up there in uh, the free state of Jefferson because that's pioneer energy. Aries is pioneer energy. So, you know, I think Jupiter and Aries is great for homesteading. It's in your fourth house. Now it's retrograde. So obviously you're going to learn from your mistakes. You know, that's where the retrograde comes in. It's like, oh, yeah, well, we got to do this now. We got to do this now. And a process of refinement. But you hang in there, right? That Sun-Pluto conjunction means that you're not going to go down with, I mean, you will go down with the ship, right? You have, a fixity about you. And I think this is one of the best parts of your chart, honestly, because you can take these risks and you can put yourself on the line. And even financially, by the way, you can put yourself, you'll put your money where your mouth is in your chart and you will finish the job because you've got that trying and, you, and, and it's this something that you've inherited through your family line, either your father or your grandfather it's something that's that because that's the eighth house. It's like it's built into you, but your chart in, in that area is intercepted, so you have to discover that, right? It's kind of like, well, I can't for, I forget Mua Mua. It might have been Braveheart, or it might have been the other one, The Patriots. One of those Mel Gibson movies where somebody talks about being scared, 
going into battle. And basically it's like, we're all scared and you don't get courage until you go into battle. And that's kind of like your eighth house because it starts off with cancer, which is, you know, this very domestic kind of um, defensive uh, kind of nurturing sign. Then it resolves itself in Virgo, which is much more conservative. Hey, let's solve the problems. The hidden country in your chart is Leo in the eighth house. So you will find yourself in those moments where you have to hang in there, where you 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 have to be the guy that puts it on the line, whether it's your money or your resources or or just your deep intentionality. I is great. And in most cases, you will come out a winner. You will you 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 will you 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 have the staying power and the heart. And that's where leadership comes in. And people will learn that from you. I really like like how Virgo follows Leo in your chart. You've got Mercury, you've got Venus, um, Saturn, and looks like you're a healer. So that's all really great Virgo stuff for being a healer. But it's also, I like, I like the fact that you will, will also kind of walk your talk, right? Like you're not afraid to roll up your sleeves because that's what Virgo does. And even Saturn and Virgo, that 29th degree camping out there, by the way, your Saturn is conjunct my son. So we got a connection, which is really interesting. I got my son at 29 Virgo. And Saturn in the ninth house is also the teacher, right? It's the teacher, the doctor, somebody who passes on tradition. And it really comes on later in life. So you have a pretty interesting chart here. Um, the only fixed signs or the fixed planets you have are Sun and Pluto. And being that they're in the eighth house, that could be enough, right? You may not need more to carry the day and follow through on things. So you've got a fair amount of cardinal, a fair amount of mutable, a fair amount of earth, right? So the highest part of your chart, the ninth house, so you're, you know, ninth house, you're a quester. But eventually you run into Saturn in the ninth house. You, you, you can run into problems, usually with authorities when you're out of the quest, right? <laughs> like that's Saturn in the ninth house. And then you, ultimately you have to become the authority. You know, it's like, screw it. You know, I'll run for city council or I'll be the mayor or you know, I'll start an alternative board to their board so that we can do something new and different. And that's part of your lesson as well. You got an interesting chart and most of it is above the horizon, right? So you're expressing yourself out into the world. And the, and the only thing that really keeps you tethered is Jupiter down here in the fourth house. So you need that kind of pioneer space. You need that home where you can kind of spread out and stretch out and feel like it's much more expansive than sort of the encroaching walls of the city or an urban environment. And your true note is in Pisces, which is interesting down there in the third house. So part of what you're here to do is to um, understand how to share information with other people um, in very unique ways. Like Virgo is very didactic, right? You do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. Pisces isn't. Pisces operates more in the realm of symbols, uh, more in the realm of imagery and allegory, uh, music, right? It's not direct. So part of your ability to communicate here in this lifetime is going to be colored by Pisces and finding ways to uh, share information with people that kind of gets, you know, inside of them. Because a lot of times, you know, you've got enough Virgo in your chart and you've got the South Node conjuncting Mercury in your chart. So you've got unfinished business with sharing information. You just have to find new ways to share it in this lifetime. And, um, you know, it'd be, I think the, 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 what would be a, a good correlate? It would be like homeopathy, right? So we'll, we'll just, we'll just play with this idea that, that Virgo is allopathy. Like this hurts, you take this and theoretically it will cure you. Allopathy would be um, naturopathy or homeopathy would be very different, right? It'd be much more, Piscean. It's like, okay, we'll give you the thing that you're suffering from. And as you begin to build an immunity to that thing, that's the thing that will cure you. To me, that's very Piscean, right? So I think that would be a, a kind of a world that you would uh, do very well in. And then you've got Sag rising. So you need to continue to expand your horizons and grow in, in good faith and good cheer. And, and we're in Sag territory. And speaking of synchromysticism, I got Jupiter behind me, which is the ruler of Sag. And you have Chiron there and Chiron and Sagittarius. I, I, I'd be really interested to understand your Chiron 
as it relates to traveling to a foreign place like Fiji or even Hawaii, which I think is very foreign and alien in some ways, because you would run into some interesting issues in those places with Chiron and Sagittarius. Um, and you may find it to be very uncomfortable in, in, in some regards, you know, like either the outsider or the scapegoat or, you know, because you would have to integrate that and then integrate what Chiron, it's like, okay, I took my lumps. I learned from this and now I can integrate it into my life and I can be either less judgmental or if I need to uh, create more boundaries so I don't have to go through those things again. So, I mean, that's just kind of a random sample of your chart, but that's, that's, you know, sort of the, the what I would well, call well, the top, top layer. <laughs> Thanks for that. And, and I, you know, more than anything, just wanted to use this as an illustration for the audience. And uh, on a personal level, I can, uh, with following you, I can see why I periodically get in trouble a bit. So, <laughs> but, uh, thanks. And I look forward to really being able to go through a chart like this um, after studying with your course a few months. I know it's uh, not going to happen overnight, but uh, really looking forward to it. And thank you for that, Robert. Yeah, you're and, welcome. And uh, Mike also is uh, a Virgo. It would be uh, kind of neat to get his chart read So. Day. I grabbed my chart um, actually while you were doing this. Oh, I'm a Virgo fantastic. ascendant Leo. I was um yeah um it's funny I was born like 12 hours after Kobe Bryant and I have so many connections with him. Hopefully I don't die in a helicopter accident. Kobe has an intense chart, man. Yeah. You know, his so zero, so zero Virgo so Regulus is sitting right on your son now. Right? And fixed star Regulus was in Leo for centuries and then in 2011 it went into virgo so that's a that's a heavy you know what is it uh heavy the crown for he who wears it mm -hmm. right so you're you're tasked with leadership with yeah. regulus on your son but it's ver you know this is a really interesting discussion because we've been in that leo regulus cycle for centuries and the whole idea of the leo regulus cycle would be like monarchies you know, top-down Confucianism, you know, things like that, divine divine rule. But when it shifted into Virgo, that's a game changer. It's a celestial game changer. And and I and I and I still think we're we're struggling with that as a, kind of a, a planetary body because what's happened, it's kind of like, okay, men suck and we're gonna put women in power now which is this whole kind of, because Virgo is a feminine sign, right? And like, we've been through that since 2011. We've seen this kind of weird manifestation of it. And, it, and, 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 I, and I feel like because Regulus will be in Virgo for a very long time, we're still just kind of working it out. It's kind of like, okay, well, the people have the power now, theoretically, but what we're going to do is we're going to place people in power that look for all intents and purposes like it's people power but it's not it's just kind of a cosmetic um application of virgo but you would ultimately be kind of and not to say that a woman couldn't do it either i, I want to be clear about that i just i just, we just look around I mean, we just talked about kamala harris right we look at people like uh, Theresa may or we look like look at people like uh, maloney maloney the phony uh in italy uh and and just how they're they're they're, they're propped up like it's all very kind of virgo-esque and fits the sky clock but it's a very young very nascent kind of application of power shifting from monarchical divine right rule to the people so we have some time to work this thing out and uh but that's where it's headed and mike you would you would be the embodiment of something like that that's funny because I work literally in decentralization and I'm a champion of it. And that's what I talk about at a lot of events and things. So, uh, and as, as an ardent, uh, voluntarist as well. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, it's interesting that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And how does this relate to the overall grander? What's your take on this, like on the procession and the overall ages and because like, uh, 
there's this idea that we're leaving the Piscean, which is that top down uh, look towards authority, uh, you know, the the figure of, of, of Jesus and the priest class and everyone as the those who are kind of the, the controllers to the uh, now this going into the air sort of um, or excuse me, into the Aquarian. So from the water to the air. Right. Uh, to this Aquarian age of, of of more of a decentralized notion of spirituality and us uh, of the individual, but also going back to smaller groups and going to to sort of uh, not so such a large in infrastructure, uh, yeah, more like smaller villages that are decentralized and all that, but not looking towards authority so much as but seeing authority in ourselves. Um, where do you come with your overall take over the years in terms of not only the procession and wh where we are with the ages, but how that relates to where we are right now. Yeah. I mean, you know, where are we in the Kali Yuga? You know, how long is this thing going to last? Right. I mean, some people could are, are positing that we're, we're leaving the Kali Yuga. Uh, some people say, well, we've got, you know, thousands of years before we leave the Kali Yuga. You know, I, it's, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, it, it, when the Buddha was asked about suffering, you know, basically said it's all relative, right? So I think you could have a relative approach to this idea of the Kali Yuga. Um, there, you know, the, this whole idea of cycles and time, and it's really, really fascinating. I think we started to go into the Aquarian age in 1963, when or 62 rather, when there were, I believe, six planets in Aquarius. It was February 4th. It's off it's that that chart of February 4th, 1962 is often referred to as the Antichrist chart. Um, so you, so we have that. That happens in 62. In 63, on 1122, Kennedy is killed, right? Theoretically. There are some people who think he didn't die. I personally do yeah. think he did. Um, and so we have the death of Kennedy, which begins to usher in kind of this dark wave Aquarian age. And right on the heels of that, you have Johnson, who creates the Great Society, right, which is a very Aquarian idea, right? Everybody's going to be raised up, and nobody's going to be poor anymore, and every, nobody's going to get hungry, and you know, and everybody's going to have the right to vote. I mean, all these nascent Aquarian ideas start popping in 1964, 1965. So that, in and of itself, is kind of this ushering into the Aquarian age. And then of course you have like MK Ultra, and then the drugs that come in, uh, and then you have you know this whole thing with rock and roll, which is very very Aquarian, right? It's like destroying these institutions. Rock is a very you know you have a band. It's not just like a crooner like Frank Sinatra or Bing Crosby. It's the band, which is a very Aquarian thing. So we get ushered into the Aquarian age during the '60s. You have the Summer of Love, of course psychedelics play a huge role. And we've just been in that wave for a very long time. And now as we approach the next ingress of Pluto next year, and then the final ingress of Pluto at the end of 2024, we're really staring down this idea of the Aquarian age. And a lot of those things you said, I believe are valid and true. And there's also a very dark side to this because Aquarius is very cold. Right. It is a cold sign. You know, it's distant. It, you know, there's there, it, it appears in the major arcana as the star card. Right. And you have the water bearer and stars seem distant and cold and far away, which is what Aquarius can appear to be at times. So there is that, too, with Aquarius. Like we don't care. You know, we got a dose of the dark Aquarian age in 2020 when Saturn went into Aquarius and we all had a collective experience together. Like, I think it was the first time in the modern era, maybe since World War II. But even with World War II, it wasn't the whole world going through it at the same time. Like, Bolivia was not going through World War II. Colombia was not going through World War II. But in 2020, with the lockdowns, every place was going through it pretty much, right? So that's an Aquarian event. And it is a dark, dystopian Aquarian event. So when, when we talk about the Aquarius age, it's not all just rainbows and butterflies. I mean, we got to deal with things like AI. And I do think there could be some positive applications of AI. I'm not a complete Luddite in that world. But we have to we have to talk about it. We have to talk about transhumanism. And this whole transgender thing is really just a gateway drug to transhumanism. And we have to talk about that, chimeras, like all, the, all this weird shit 
that goes along with Aquarius, the surveillance state, like all of it, man. It's all in that bucket. I did a show on Gaia when I was there about the dark Aquarian age. I've been talking about it for a while. But also to your point, there's the other side of this, which is decentralization and smaller groups and, you know, cross-pollination, like your world, my world, Barry's world, you know, the various members of the audience and the tribes, you know, co-mingling and, you know, having the kind of Pis Pisces Vesica moment where we meet in the middle. I think that's all part of it as well. I think we're we're dealing with like a big picture um, vision where quite possibly we could be dealing with separate realities, you know, separate versions of what Aquarius represents. And, and I think it's really important to understand this, too. When you deal with Aquarius, you're also dealing with the two other air signs that are part of Aquarius, because Aquarius is the culmination of what starts in Gemini goes to the midpoint in Libra and then resolves itself in Aquarius. So when you when you take that into account, well, of course Gemini would be part of the discussion. You know, we would have two separate worlds or two separate realities or multiple worlds or multiple realities. And then Libra figuring out what our relationship is to all of this and who we're going to be with and how we're going to partner up or not partner up with it. So when we talk about Aquarius, we have to talk about the two. And of course, laws, you know, laws are created um, you know, through Libra and Sagittarius, right? Well, let's make things fair. Well, let's make things equitable. That's part of the Libra discussion in Aquarius. But it's, again, it's, you know, it's kind of synthetic, right? I think if if we could probably break it down in a, in a simple way, could we have a synthetic version of the age of Aquarius, an organic version of the age of Aquarius, or could we have a meeting in the middle in the Vesica Pisces of the age of Aquarius where we take the best of both worlds so that we can create something new? And I think to me, that would, that would be the ideal is that if we, you know, cause I'm not anti-technology. I think if we could use technology and new materials and new ways of doing things and do it with consciousness and awareness and being grounded, um, it can do incredible things. Right. I mean, if we took all this money that we ship off to Ukraine and Israel to get laundered and washed and actually did something with it and say, here, let's throw this at this. And, oh, you got a really good idea for graphene oxide as a material. Oh, you're into 3D printers. Oh, you're, you're, you can make a house with a 3D printer in about three days. Well, why don't we, instead of investing in freaking, uh, you know, what, what was it? Uh, the, uh, the things that kept your lungs pumping during COVID, that whole, that whole thing with Ford was weird, right? Right. Oh, yeah, we're going to throw all this money at Ford so that we can we can create this technology or build these machines so that we can keep people breathing through. Oh, no, just throw that money instead at about, you know, 3,000 3D printers that you can, you know, print out really cool houses with. I mean, to me, that's the Aquarian age. And we just have to reallocate resources and those resources are ultimately us, right? Once we reroute, this gets into, you know, as below, so above. Like when you make changes to your lives, theoretically, the outer life or the outer world, you know, begins to reflect those changes. Did I answer your question? Did I, did I, did I, did I cover that? Yeah, I think amazingly well. And um, once again, bringing back into focus that in this physical realm, we deal with duality, no matter what age we're in. I mean, that That's is Gemini point. right there, right? Those yeah, are the absolutely. shoulders in the body. That's the duality. Yeah. Uh, I think Gemini is an important uh, actor always um, in the procession of the eminence or the um, sort of, uh, you know, I've, I've actually been studying a lot of this book I've mentioned all the time on the podcast, Thinking in Destiny uh, by uh, Harold Waldwin Percival. And he has a whole, you know, it's all about how we create our own destiny. And it's amazing how it relates to fate and everything. And obviously this is, very much connected to astrology, but his whole zodiacal, zodiacal, or whatever you want to say, however you say it, um, in, in sort of reflection on it, on the stars and, and everything is very important. And I think you'll agree with this. It's not so much about where the stars and the sky clock are. It's about what they represent. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, and, and so he connects them directly to the circle, which is the universal symbol for reality and how in every 30 degrees, 
we create a new angle as we process um, our thoughts into physical reality. And so he relates every single sign to that process. So yeah. every single one of those signs has a very important role in the creation of reality. Yes. And I think it's a really important way to look at astrology. Yeah. Gemini is one of my favorite topics because it seems like this world is, like if you look at Sagittarius, in the galactic center, which is at 26, Sagittarius. The bow of Sagittarius is pointing all the way across to the constellation Gemini. So these two signs have a really interesting connection to each other. And it's just amazing when you when you drop into Gemini and you see all these kind of weird, like, synchronicities and doubles. And, like, even Kennedy. Like, I did a whole thing on Kennedy in the Kennedy timeline, how it's related to Gemini, because he's a Gemini. He's killed on 1122. So you have the Twin Towers with the 11, the two twos. Um, it's in Dallas. And you can see inside the word Dallas, you can see the, the, the Twin Towers, like the two L's inside of Dallas. And then George Bush uh, Sr. is theoretically in Dallas at that time, who happens to be a Gemini. Right. And this is this weird Gemini effect. You go to 9 11, uh, 9 11 happens. The moon is in Gemini, Saturn's in Gemini. Um, you have the other Bush as presidents. You have the two Bushes. And then you have uh, Larry, uh, what's his name? Like, uh, and Fink or Larry, what's it? Yeah. Who did this tower? Yeah. Uh, Larry, Larry, Larry Steen. He's a Stein, yeah, right? Stein, um, yeah. yeah. He's a Gemini. Right. So the guy who buys the Twin Towers is a Gemini. Rudy Giuliani is a Gemini. Donald Trump. Well, the is Twin a Tower, the Twin Towers. Twin Towers are Gemini. Everything is based on Gemini, right? You look at in Freemasonry, you have, you know, the twin pillars of mystery, you know, Boaz and Yakin, right? And even like the Freemasonic uh, board is based on black and white, which is duality, which is Gemini. So Gemini plays a huge role um, in this reality. Of course, Donald Trump is a Gemini, and you know the pre the Trump presidency has set so much in motion, for better or worse, depending on how you look at it. So yeah, Gemini is a big, really big player, and seems like based on 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 this whole concept of duality and sort of torsion fields in between these two points of polarization, like it really defines our realm in a lot of ways. So the idea is to step out of that dualistic trap which is where a lot of us or a lot of people have been caught in. Um, Robert, uh, I look at things more from an astrophysiological perspective, and I like to throw out a couple of things just to see what your take is, uh, you know, and how you could jive it with your system or not. Um, let's start with Aquarius, you know, Aquarius being an air sign. If we correlate that, which is the way I look at the world, uh, that's going to correlate with uh, also the element of nitrogen uh, right after hydrogen. So it's the second layer of ether. And then that nitrogen is what makes things coagulate. We know that out in the farm here, you know, when we apply this to farming. But uh, then the next step down, of course, is water. So Aquarius, uh, you know, really having to do with that that air as it uh, is about to descend into the next element that's responsible, uh, responsive or responsible for all dissemination of informational fields and things, which is water. And then also Aquarius on that physiological side is about balancing the water element, the equal distribution of fluids within the body. And then, uh, you know, if you go into um, Gemini, you're looking at the, that element that makes all the fibrous tissues and and branching out of circulatory and you know nerve branches and and so forth and fibrin that makes uh you know tissues and and so forth that you know coagulates in the matter eventually so um any comments or does that work at all with the traditional astrology the way you would look at things i don't know but i i i just heard your true note in pisces in the third house right <laughs> because you, you you were taking that very kind of didactic energy uh, of Virgo up in your ninth house and bringing it down and having a very interesting and kind of creative association with those things, which is what Pisces would do. I think it's interesting that when you look at Aquarius, and this is to your point, that 
if if you see the water bearer, you know where where is the urn or or the or the barrel tilting? It's tilting towards the next sign, which is Pisces, which is exactly mm -hmm. what you were, what you were talking water, about. Right, water. If you go the other mm -hmm. way, if you go the other way with the clock, and you start with Aries, and go to Pisces, and then you go to Aquarius. Aquarius is this interesting synthesis of aqua, which would be water, and Aries, right? So you have aqua Aries or, or Aquarius. So you can go the other direction as well. But I, I love your analogy of the water from Aquarius descending into, into form, which would be the next sign over. And yeah, these, yeah. these houses are, are really important. And each house refines the house prior to it, right? So, and you know, yeah. And by the time we get to Pisces, and mm -hmm. All 12 signs are in Pisces mm -hmm. and, you know, the river of the chart flows into Pisces and, uh, you know, and it joins the great cosmic ocean. And that's why and, whenever uh, you sit down mm -hmm. with, with, you know, if you had 20 different Pisces in front of you, you'd have 20 different people. And this is one of the reasons why it's difficult to be a Pisces because they're, they're basically handling all, all of, all of their 11 signs in their chart. And, in that same schematic, um, Pisces, of course, uh, not just a water element, but it in uh, physiology is responsible for the hemoglobin uh, in the blood and, and the resonance of Pisces, which also uh, correlates with ferrum phosphoricum in the, in the natural world and embodies that resonance. Uh, that allows Pisces to take the air element from the sign just prior to it and transpose it into the blood for circulation and to uh, bring that air through the water circulation element. Oh, you're, you're, you're going to take the astrology like a duck in water. I can tell it's going to mm -hmm. be, it's going to be good. You're going to, you're going to dig it. Well, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So, uh, Robert, 2024, um, going to be a wild ride. Yes. I, I, I should have said, no, nah, no, it's just business as usual. No, it's going to be, it's going to be weird. It's going to be weird. And, uh, you know, we've got these ingresses to Pluto and Aquarius and then the regress. And we have this election in November of 29 Capricorn. It's kind of like the out, last outpost of the old culture, the old world, the old paradigm. And it's happening right in November on the election and then of course the eclipse which we were talking about earlier in aries and um, coming again up through the hill country and really making this well you have the you know the x marks the spot right with the eclipse from 2016 uh 2017 which started in oregon and, and emptied out in florida and this one starts off the coast of mexico right through drug cartel uh, country by the way and goes right up through Texas and winds up in the northeastern part of the United States and Canada. So it creates a natural X. And both of those eclipses were uh, total eclipses. And there's a lot more that, that, that goes along with that as well. But um, I was talking with uh, S.J. Anderson, who's another astrologer on Twitter. And he was talking about this eclipse in 1968 in Aries. And in 1968 lbj was running for president and he dropped out and i looked at lbj's chart he's got saturn in aries at nine degrees and we were talking about maybe that there would be kind of a redux of you know it, it, and if anything the redux would be biden right because he would be sort of the 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 uh, sort of the the anchor in time the democratic candidate the sandy democratic candidate and then dropping out and and i think most of us believe that to be true that biden will not be running for president that's just part of it um we just saw this is nothing i mean it does have something to do with astrology because it gets into aquarius and communication and pluto which is a fixed sign and kind of locking down right like the fcc just took control of the internet you know that's a big deal and and it doesn't bode well for people you know, if if your guy is in the is in is in office, and you're in favor of censorship, and you're in favor of uh, limiting what people can say, and your guy or your gal 
uh, is willing to do that, then great. You know, you'll love it. But if you're not, it's not going to be good. Conversely, if we have, because the president controls the FCC, right? If you have a president who does control the FCC, who who is pro-freedom, who is pro-free speech, uh, First Amendment, then it could work in, work in your favor. But it's a lot of power to be handed over to one governing body. And you guys were talking about how you're getting shows deleted. And, you know, I think we're in for another, you know, another round of that. For me, in the summer of uh, 2012 or no, 2020, uh, I lost my YouTube channel for months. And as soon as the election was kind of a foregone conclusion, they let me have my channel back. Right. And I can see this happening throughout 20, 2024. The, the thing that I do like is that uh, Pluto and Aquarius is strange, right? Like weird shit can happen. And even the best laid plans of these so called social engineers don't always work out. And one of the things that I've been talking about for a while is this idea of strange bedfellows. This is what Aquarius brings with it. And you can look at like what's happening in Israel. And when did you ever think that people like Rand Paul would be on the same page as AOC? Right. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about this idea that all of a sudden these people that were on the other side of the fence or on the other side of the battlefield are in a weird way now our allies. And, and that could also flip the other way too. You know, looking at somebody like, not for me, but for some people, oh, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin. Oh, these guys are, these guys are great. They call out all the liberal bullshit. And then all of a sudden you, you know, watch them go into the, some, you know, paroxysm of bloodlust over Israel. It's like, oh, look at that. Yeah, they were strange bedfellows. Get out of bed, right? Get out of my bed. So it has it has a converse effect, but I feel like that that's going to be an interesting part of Pluto and Aquarius that we have this opportunity because if we're going to get away from this whole idea of duality, we 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 have to we have to start breaking bread with people that we don't normally break bread with, and and we find we we find common ground. Like we find common ground to do that, and and, and that will make us stronger. Um, it's interesting that RFK is running under a third party platform, you know, being an independent. I don't know where the future of elections is going to go in this country, but I was on with Regina Meredith, I think during the Trump Hillary Clinton election cycle, and I talked about at a certain point in time there's going to be a third party. There will be a legitimate third party. And the third party will be disaffected members of these other parties that have much more of a common ground than sort of the, you know, the uniparty kind of membership. And I can see that coming out of this Pluto. And if not a party, certainly a coalition or an alliance of people. That... It, is in, it is interesting that the third party could really be the second party because the other two parties have become one party. They're just a uniparty. And they're yeah. a uniparty. So we're still back into the two-party system in a way. In a way. Um, looking at the numerology of 2024, too, you have two, zero, two, four, a lot of twos, a lot of duality. The the two and then the zero, of course, for the infinite and do the other two. So those twos coming together is the four. And you add those all up, it's eight, which, as someone said in the chat here, is the infinity sign. Infinity symbol, um, yeah. yeah. Infinity symbol. So very, very special date. Very, very special numbers there. Uh, and um, interested to know if we will even will have an election. I think point. we will. I think we will. You do. I do. Whether it's a fair election or not, that's debatable. And, and circling back to Newsom, I know Bear is interested to hear more about this. There's a lot of talk about him being thrown in last minute into the fray to take over for Biden. Where do you see that potentiality happen, you know, in terms of his choice? Oh, I, I, I think there's a good chance he could be president. Very good chance. What about I mean, Big he, Mike? Uh, Big Mike, Big Mike would come in maybe as a Vice. VP, maybe. Um, it depends on, you know, th so the Democrats have an issue with Kamala. Because she represents 
a specific voting block. And if they leapfrog Newsom over Kamala, um, they would be upset. So we're talking about the black female Democratic vote, right? They don't want to see that. That could be problematic for them. So they have to come up with a way to kind of massage this. And maybe it's by bringing back an Obama uh, and bring an Obama in. It's like, oh, well, why don't you just make her president? I, I don't have the answer. That, and I'm not really concerned with it. But I do know that politically, it's kind of a sticky territory for the Democrats. Because, oh, look, he's white, he's male, he's got privilege, he's stepping over Kamala. Yeah. But that American said, <laughs> yeah, that said, um, you know, he got the papal blessing from Xi. Like, yep. he, he is Xi's appointed candidate. And Amazing how they cleaned up the city so quickly for when G comes in. I know, right? Where did all those homeless people go? Um, you know, yeah. And going those, back uh... to the trans thing real quick, too, <laughs> it seems apparent that they are going to allow for that information to come out. And how fitting would it be for that to happen as we go into the election moving towards now this acceptance of trans. I think they're talking about having a trans month, right? Like they already have pride month and trans month. Right. So to, to it, this seems insane, but I think they've been, they've actually been working towards this, this slow, uh, um, uh, you know, dispensation of, of truth to, of who Michelle Obama actually is and letting it leak out so that they could have a trans president. Uh, I think that's I think you're right on the money with that. And not only is that in the realm of, of possibility, Michelle Obama is a Capricorn. And when you look at Capricorn, you'll see images of Baphomet, like Baphomet and Capricorn kind of intermingle. Right. And when you look at Baphomet, Baphomet is a unisex god. You know, Baphomet has uh, breasts and, you know, has a penis. Right. I mean, so from an astrological perspective, it would make total sense because Michelle is a Capricorn. She is a goat, right? And, and Baphomet is the the goat god. Yeah, and it almost feels, you know, I'd love your your guys' opinion on this. I've seen certain people, uh, I've seen people on the on the internet talk about how, like those moments on Ellen and the moment with um, her coming out of the uh hotel with Obama where you can, you can clearly see her junk that those moments were staged that they were that they were put out there for public consumption so people could begin to wrap their head around this idea what do you guys think about that so uh big Mike tied something to the inside of his pants there and did that uh just just to mess with us or what no I think that maybe um, that's, you know, big was... Mike. that's a big Mike and they yeah. but maybe what big yeah. Mike did is untied the thing Right. Ah, okay. Yep. Yeah. I get you. I, I'm in firm I, agreement I of that. Just looking at um, her body as an anatomist, it it definitely doesn't look like a female anatomy in any way. And I can go through everything from facial to other anatomical features that you know. I I spent a lot of years just looking at bodies for a living, so I'm kind of pretty sure what's happening there. You know, I wanted to ask you something also. Um, being that this, I believe, is a time of great revelation and this next election, which I'm kind of 50 50 whether it's going to happen or not, maybe part of the re uh, revelation is the fact that all the people that vote in any of these elections, including the upcoming, have to register as a 14th Amendment corporate subject rather than as a free American national in order just to vote. And in fact, the vote is uh, putting something in the government suggestion box as far as who you want to see as far as the new corporate board member, whether it be congressional member or, or executive or otherwise. So the whole thing is fake. Many of us have known that for a long time and have been trying to alert people that we have to repopulate the latent constitutional republic and uh, get rid of these corporate elections that really have nothing to do with us. So if I go out there and register and admit to something that I'm really not, I'm not a corporate subject, and then I vote for who's ever running, um, 
it really has nothing to do with me because that's a private corporation and the elections are just a, a theater in order to help us think that, you know, we have some say in something in the first place. But uh, it doesn't matter how fair the vote is or how transparent anything is. It's still fake and it has nothing to do with this. So could a possible suspension of the elections be a lead up into the grand revelation that we've been really duped beyond what people can imagine and that we all have to become aware of that before we can you know repopulate an actual government that is for us and by us i don't know i mean pluto is retrograde uh, at the time of the election and it, it so i don't think the election itself bodes well i always you know this is a little off topic and i, and I, I hope I, i'll try to return to that but I always thought it was really weird for elections to be held in November during Scorpio season because yeah. there's so there's so much underworld activity during that time, right? It's like there's a lot of sleight of hand. Um, there's a lot of money, unseen money that gets passed. This is all just part of Scorpio. And if you really wanted to have open and fair elections, just, just move them to Sagittarius season. Right. I think it's as easy as just changing the date, because when you get into Sagittarius, you have to deal with things honestly. You're dealing with the law. So that would be my solution. Just change the damn election date and put it in Sagittarius. But that said, um, you know, I think it's interesting that and by the way, you have to keep your eye on Nikki Haley because she is. Man, she will sell out for anybody. You know, she's like meeting with Larry Fink. She's meeting with Jamie Dimon. You know, she's meeting with all these people and getting their backing. And Nikki Haley will do anything to get elected. And she's an Aquarian. And I I, I, mm -hmm. I looked at her chart last week and I rectified it. And she's got that long hair. So that makes her Leo rising. She's born on the last day of Capricorn or the first day of Aquarius, depending on the time of day she's born. And I think she's an Aquarian. And Pluto will be on her sun sign during this election cycle, which is pretty significant. Now, when you listen to her talk, she wants people to register online and you could, you know, you're going to be your name. So does this kind of dovetail with what you're talking about, Barry, in terms of the election? So now you have sort of this beast coming together, right? The beast system, which is this kind of corporate identity that you're talking about. And then you have the um, kind of the real ID aspect being validated virtually. So I, I think that there's probably some some merit to what, what, you're, what you're saying here. And again, that brings us back to dark Aquarius, where, oh, we're all going to have the same reality. Oh, we're all going to be online and we're all going to have our names. And we're all going to be vetted. Well, yeah, it's not. I mean, on some level, I kind of get it. Like if people know who you are and you're transparent, there's probably less of a chance you're going to talk shit. Right. But on the other hand, making and forcing people to do that is not the solution either. So, yeah, I could see that happening and then bringing, you know, sort of the real ID twist and, you know, getting online and, and validate. And then how do you validate it? Right. How do you how are you going to validate that? You know, you'll you'll stick your eye into your 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 camera, <laughs> and you'll you'll get the you'll get the retinal scan. And that's that's how it'll all go. That's that's how I think it'll all go down. So, but again, we're dealing with Aquarius, and things don't always turn out the way they go, the way they plan them. With Aquarius, like weird shit happens, disruptions happen. So, yeah, that's that's my take on it. What about planetary stuff in terms of? Mother Nature, uh, that's the other wild card at play, I think. Yeah. So when you when we get into so Neptune leaves Pisces, which is at the end of 2025, and you look at all the outer planets, we'll do the roll call. You got Pluto and Aquarius, you've got Neptune and Aries, Uranus and Gemini, and Saturn and Aries. So what's missing? Earth and water. We don't hit any Earth until the end of 2028 when Saturn begins its first ingress into Taurus. So when you talk about planetary, to me, those are very arid conditions. We're not dealing with a wet world. 
we're not we're not dealing in 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 there's no ground there's there's everything is ideological or intellectual and we're just very disconnected from earth during that three year period uh so in terms of the environment i i, I don't think it really bodes well for the environment and does here's the fire does the fire element play more into this we've seen a lot of forest fires yeah well you're gonna have neptune and neptune and aries right saturn and aries yeah for three for three years so fire uh volcanic activity and you know and maybe barry can can bring some of his interesting science analogies in here but if you don't have any of that viscosity you know in the air or even below the planet you're you're dealing with a really dry system you know, and if you have, like, say, we'll use an engine. If your engine runs out of oil, what's going to happen? It's going to seize up, right? Everything gets dry, and you know, your 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 piston starts slamming against the uh, the shaft, and your rings burn out, and you know, now all of a sudden your engine is convulsing. So this is what happens when things go dry, when there's no viscosity, and that three year period, there's no viscosity. There's nothing lubricating anything at that time everything is way up here it's super heady you know we're dealing with the theater of war the you know one of the last times uh neptune was in aries was during the freaking civil war like huh. neptune literally moves into aries the day fort sumter surrenders and then you throw saturn on top of that right so this uh next three years are gonna I, i'm not a doom and gloom guy right but if if we were to take those astrological influences from the outer planets, I would say that these three years would represent hell on Earth because of the heat, right? You have the heat with Neptune and Aries and Saturn and Aries. You have the air with Pluto and Aquarius, right? Everything is combustible. Air with Uranus and Gemini, and you know, it's kind of cyclonic and you know, very restless. So that this three-year stretch is going to be a real initiation for all of us, right? But conversely, and I've talked about this too as well, like when you get into Aries, you get into birth, right? So when it's the first sign, right? When you come into your chart, you come into the ascendant, which is Aries, it's the first house. And classically, what does birth look like? Well, it's violent and bloody. That's what it looks like, right? Birth is violent. It is clearly uh, an act where the mother is discharging blood, right? And that's really Aries-like. So in as much as we're going through this three-year period, where it looks like it's hell on earth, we're also going through birth because it is it is a heavy birth cycle too because when when in astrology that moment of birth when the body comes into the world through the first house in aries what happens it settles into the second house which is taurus and then the body begins to become slightly conscious of itself right well that's what happens at the end of 2028 beginning of 2029 saturn moves into taurus and that is the possibility for us to come and settle into this new body, right? But so much can happen. And we know that that during a birth, there, there is a tremendous amount of crisis involved as well. So many things can go wrong. So this next three years, I think, will embody that. And, um, you know, we're, you know, you know, we're going to live through, like, really intense, interesting Times. The other thing, too, is next year is the year of the dragon. And the Chinese revere the dragon, right? It is their big power symbol. So I think 2024 is the year China makes its moves, right? China China's going all in in 2024. And you throw that into the equation, and man, it's going to be, uh, be live, as the kids say. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little physiological progression again, if you look at Aries, you know, that's where the resonance from above initiates the spark at the optic, optic thalamus. That's and, right. Which yep. is the, yeah. yeah. And then that 
goes down to the brain stem, which is torus. And then, uh, you know, eventually uh, uh, through Gemini and then cancer. And then the cancer, of course, designated or symbolized by the uh, the shell, you know, of the crab and so forth. But the, uh, the crab actually carries its eggs, you know, underneath itself and, uh, you know, is all about making the new body, the new house and so forth. So it, it, it really, you know, if everything I hear you say, it kind of runs parallel with um from my perspective anyway, can't you know, you without say, getting into, yeah, go ahead. Can't you say then Barrett goes to Leo, which is the heart. And yeah. that's um, what you embody obviously is a Leo. And uh, that's really, I think going to play a massive role towards the end as we have that heart resonance after we go through the fire, interesting dragon dragons being born through fire, you know, um, the egg coming out. It's not a wet and juicy birth. Uh, traditionally it's like they're literally born through fire so um yeah uh, weather warfare i think is going to pick up uh there seems to be evidence that china was involved possibly with the um the hawaii incident in lahaina uh and um yeah bu buckle up friends uh definitely i will stress this again i stressed this on a private call yesterday probably doesn't make sense to be in an urban center you can get out to a more rural area that's going to make a lot of sense absolutely yeah, I, I would and, agree uh, with that folks that are yeah folks that are moving rural and starting to grow realize you really have to have your wits about you growing things these days because there's a lot of things in the atmosphere settling in the soil and the vegetation that is really affecting growing we know that firsthand just being farmers and we get reports uh you know all around the planet as far as people having the same kind of thing uh, but it can be overcome with good farming techniques and knowledge, uh, especially knowledge of astrology, you know, the way we apply it to our farming. So you can thrive, you can still grow things. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. It's uh, we're, we're going into some pretty intense times, but uh, I remain optimistic because having treated bodies for so long, when people come in, and they're super, super sick, which is, I think, where we're at as a culture these days. Sometimes things have to come to the uh, surface. It looks really ugly. It's unpleasant. But it's the only way to get things out in the open and then go through a healing. Uh, I want to hear a lot of your uh, – this has been a fantastic discussion, and I want to hear your final thoughts and things. But I saved the most important question uh, to the last here. Uh, Eagles 49ers. Oh, that's the, the, so astrologically, <laughs> astrologically, it's a clash of what we just talked about, Sagittarius and Gemini. Kyle Shanahan, the Sagittarius, Luke Sirianni, the Gemini. And oh. uh, those are the coaches for the respective teams, 49ers and Eagles. And right now, Mars is in Sag and the Sun is in Sag. So I'm going with Kyle and the Niners this weekend. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, being from San Francisco, well, thanks for indulging me on that. But no, any other it's, it's, yeah, it's fine. I, Go I ahead. love no, I just uh, by the way, I am a huge Brock Purdy fan. I love this kid, I think he's amazing. He's a Capricorn, he embodies that Capricorn cool, like he's you know advanced beyond his years. And he and Shanahan astrologically are really lined up, like they're kind of like one mind. Um, in a lot of ways on the field with their with their charts. And he's got Mars in Aquarius. So he's not afraid to take a risk or do something out of the ordinary with that Mars in Aquarius. It makes him a bit of bit of a gambler, right? Like, and I just I just dig the kid. He's so humble. Um, he's a Christian uh, and he takes accountability for his mistakes and you know, he's going up against uh, Jalen Hurts, who's who's a Leo, and who's also very humble and a Christian. So we have these interesting kind of storylines and narratives happening for um, this weekend. And, you know, what's also interesting, too, is that when you look at Philadelphia, of course, we have the Constitution and everything, the Declaration of Independence, everything goes along with Philadelphia, right? San Francisco is where the U.N. started. Right. They drew up the U.N. charter in San Francisco. Mm. So you have San Francisco and the U.N. and this kind of birth of global governance 
And then all the, you know, the colonial stuff and the early American stuff and the founding father stuff in Philadelphia. I, I you know, I think it's fascinating and go Niners. What I like about Purdy too, is he represents that wild card that a lot of NFL scouts uh, and people that rely more on statistics and how people look on paper rather than how they actually are as people and, you know, where their heart is. Uh, Purdy, of course, being the ultimate underdog and then uh, proving all the skeptics wrong. That's that's the part I enjoy because, you know, back when I played, it was just less analytical, uh, right. you know, in draft time and and, and and who they gave scholarships to. They got to, you know, they came out and they talked to you and got to know you as a person and, and made judgments, uh, you know, that superseded just, uh, you know, all the tangibles on paper. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I re I remember watching Iowa State play and pretty, I think it was his freshman year and he had either just come into the game or it might've been one or two of his early early games. I remember watching him. I'm like, who is this guy, right? This kid, this kid can play. And I'm like, could he play in the NFL? And then, you know, kind of lost track of him or whatever. Um, but I had that, I had that kind of interesting aha moment with like, this, this kid's doing something kind of interesting on this field. And, you know, he comes from a, a you know, a, a background where the family has really good values and, you know, you just want to pull for the kid, right. And especially in today's extremely toxic sports environment where it's all about me and my brand and my Instagram feed and, NIL dollars, you know, Brock Purdy's pre NIL, right? And he's, he's Taylor kind Swift. of, yeah, Taylor Swift, right? Um, so I'm, I'm pulling for the kid. I, I, and I like, and Kyle is this kind of a hard guy to like. He's got a lot of, uh, Sagittarius and Virgo in his chart. So he grinds. You can just tell internally Kyle's grinding all the time because those planets are square with one another. But over time, I've gotten to like Kyle Shanahan. Because he tells the truth. I mean, he's a Sagittarius. That's what they do. And um, he's not affected. He's not a rah-rah guy. You know, what you see is pretty much what you get with Kyle. So I've gotten to like him over the, over the course of his time as being the Niners coach. And, uh, you know, and they're the only team I, I really kind of follow. I don't even watch them on TV, but I follow what they do. Uh, the Warriors are just a hot mess. Oh, my God. They're just they're they're hard they're hard to watch and um, you've got these guys who are just losing their minds. Draymond Green is losing his mind. Clay Thompson, Clay's like a really early Aquarian. I think he's like zero or one Aquarius. He's got Pluto sitting on his sun, and it's just astrology. You can just tell it's destroying him. You know he's he's, he's just losing his shit. Uh, and so they're they're. The Warriors are a very interesting study in astrology because when you look at their starting five, you have Steph Curry, who's a Pisces, Draymond Green, who's a Pisces, Andrew Wiggins, who's a Pisces, you have Clay, who's an Aquarian, and you have Kevon Looney, who's an Aquarian. So you have a starting five comprised of Pisces and Aquarius. And when those guys are on, you can really see how it works. You can see how they flow, right? But when they're off, and Pisces is a dualistic sign, boy, are they really off. Turnovers, and now they're malfunctioning emotionally. And, you know, Kerr, who's a Libra, has been playing this balancing act, right, between, like, the egos of his stars and their and their their needs and the needs of the team. and And he's not doing a very good job now. Right. He's just having a difficult time with it all. And they're just a hot mess. And I watch it because I'm like watching a train wreck. And who who hasn't like sat back and watched a wreck happen? You kind of go, whoa. Right. Like at some point, like, whoa. As an old intense. Lakers fan, I enjoy that train wreck. You're liking that train wreck, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask one thing? I don't really follow pro sports at all. I just watch maybe golf with my dad, but I do really like Aaron Rodgers. I love what he's said in public about the jibby jab. And he's just, he's the man. Is he coming back to the, uh, I heard he might be coming back to the jets. Do you think that's, that's happening? Yeah, he'll be back. He'll play. He'll play this year. Yeah. Aaron's a sag. <laughs> and, you know, it's been interesting watching him grow through truth. 
because there was a period. Um, let's see if I can pinpoint that period maybe around 2017, 2018, where Aaron, Aaron Rodgers was kind of woke. Like, he had a bit of a woke streak. And I remember him being in this commercial. Berkeley. Yeah, he did. He did go to Berkeley, although he does. He comes from a, what, a, a, a party school, Chico. He comes from Butte Community College, I think. So he's, oh, right, got a little, right. he's got a little bit of that California conservative kind of upbringing in his background. Um. But he did this commercial back in 2017 or 18, and it was with Pharrell and all these kinds of uh, millennial influencers. And they were all sitting at this table, like it was like this corporation, and he was sitting at the table. So I was like, oh, wow, Rogers has a seat at the millennial influencers table, but he's a Sag, right? And so as a Sagittarius, it's incumbent upon him to find the truth. And we watched him sort of start to peel back these layers when it came to, you know, understanding more and more about so-called reality. And it really came to a head in the uh, 2020 season where, you know, he said, he, what, what was the word he used? I'm not I wasn't vaccinated, but I was what? He used a certain word um, to cover his vaccination. And then it was like, okay, well, he got caught in a little bit of a lie or how to, not even a lie, kind of a fabrication of the truth. And then he just went all in. Now he's just, he's just, he's just all in now. Yeah. And, and um, I, I've always liked Aaron Rodgers, even though I had, I had to look at me, what are you doing at that table with those people? And that's odd. But, you know, we all grow, we all change, you know, we're not the same people we were four years ago, five years ago, 20 years ago. So yeah, he's got a really interesting chart. It's kind of clustered. You know, it's all kind of in one area in this chart. So when people have, it's called a bundle. So when people have a bundle chart, they're kind of savants and they do one or two things extremely well. And then things outside of that kind of sphere of influence they're not always that great at. Well, no, I have a... Can I say one more athlete going? who we all appreciate is Novak. Um, for his, I think he's probably the one that was most in the forefront, right? On, on terms of the jab and everything. Um, and, uh, is he, at, what's his chart? Have you looked into him at all? Because he just, seems... I have looked into you, Novak's yeah. Djokovic. Yep. <laughs> no Jabovic. Let's see. <laughs> I just, uh, yeah. Mad props on that guy. There was people at times where it's trying to say he was, you know, two faced and actually, but I think he's shown his true colors now and he is the best in the world. I mean, how phenomenal for a sign of of great things that could potentially be coming that the greatest tennis player in the world was also standing up for truth when it yeah, came so to... Yeah, so he's, he's born on May 22nd, and he's a Gemini. So he's a really early degree Gemini. With I, um, I was trying to remember if he was a Capricorn rising. He's a Capricorn rising uh, in his chart. So he's going to come across as being kind of stiff and very formal and kind of no nonsense. That's how Capricorn rising would come across. But he, you know, Gemini is a bit of a trickster and he's got Mercury in Gemini as well. So he's no dummy. I mean, he's really smart. Mercury in Gemini is fast. He's got it in the fifth house. Um, I think it'd be really interesting if he decided to write something. Because mm -hmm. he also has Jupiter in Aries and he's got, uh, where's that true node? Is that in Aries as well? Uh, let's see, where's his moon? Yeah, he's got a true node in Aries. So he's got a lot of Aries in his chart. So he can be very, very direct, but he also has a little bit of subterfuge and, you know, a little cloak and dagger with um, uh, Mercury in the sun. He's got Mars in Cancer in Gemini, like our friend Barry. So Mars in Cancer would be good for things like volley with serves back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, you look at Cancer, it's like this kind of circular symbol, right? And he's got uh, Mars Pluto trying. So he has great endurance. I mean, this guy's especially with Capricorn rising. He has an interesting chart. Um, he's got a Neptune moon I, square. So that that so there are times where he's tested in terms of his emotional commitments. That's for sure. So um, I have a possible suggestion. I went to high school with uh, Seattle Seahawks coach Pete Carroll, also uh, 
my wife knew him very well as well. And uh, him and I played on an all-star team after high school. And knowing Pete, he's a little bit more open-minded and out there than most NFL coaches. So I think with the proper introduction, you could become the first NFL uh, scouting combine astrologer. I love Pete Carroll. I think he's really interesting. <laughs> there, there was this, there was this book. What, what was what was the name of this book? It was my friend Richard Grossinger had this uh, publishing company, North Atlantic Books, and it was this weird kind of conspiracy book. And Pete Carroll is in it, and it had and something he, something to do with like Montauk or something time like travel. That. The yeah, time travel. Do, do you know what I'm talking and, about? And he, yeah, it was uh, Melchizedek. Uh, all ties in with him, and he was introduced to Pete Carroll, who he stated in the book that Pete uh, Drumbelow uh, introduced okay, so him no, no. to the two, he introduced him to the two brothers that uh, you know were transported through time. I read that book and my jaw dropped open <laughs> because uh, you know I'm like Pete, how the hell is he getting in the middle of this thing with time travel and everything? Now I haven't seen Pete for a few years, but I know him well. I could call him up and I keep uh, threatening to call him up and say, "Okay, Pete, what's going on? Did that really happen or what?" Man, I got to get him on serious sports. That that would be that would be a huge score. I, I really like Pete Carroll. I've always loved his really super upbeat persona and it's kept him young right like you know mm -hmm. uh he's a guy if, if i played in the nfl i'd want to play for pete carroll yeah 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 and he's the same guy he was in high school he's just really enthusiastic nice guy um has a lot of passion doesn't have a mean bone in his body he's a decent athlete in this time too is is he a is he a virgo is that a sign let me see if I can find uh, it. I have no idea. I think I remember him being like he'd a, be a Virgo. A Vir either a Virgo or um or or a Taurus. Let me just see here. Where do you see sports going, pro sports going? Because obviously many in this community see it as sort of modern day Rome is falling, you know, distraction of the gladiator ring of the, you know. Get, especially in the United States with this obsession with like football, which is literally like watching gladiators go to war. Um, and where do you see it? Cause it seems like a lot of people are checking out on foot on, on these pro sports, especially since COVID when like I stopped watching the NBA and I, I never thought I would stop watching the Lakers. I mean, with my connection to that team and on so many fronts, but when they put the fake audience in and oh. um it, it it had gotten and that to me as somebody who's involved with like decentralized technology and understands where they're trying to go with virtual reality and everything that was like a huge alarm bell for using th that um psyop of covid to initiate this new sort of fake world and then what's really interesting in basketball is you see all these glitches in the matrix have you seen those videos yes yeah yeah which is so where they're doing all the same thing and they're the same thing at the literally same time. Right. Freezing. He, the announcers yeah. are freezing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It, yeah it's weird. And like one. even stuff with the ball and the rim. And mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think the NFL is in trouble. I yeah. think, yeah. I, I think if, so if, if you, the NFL is woven into the fabric of America and if you want to get rid of America, and you want to create a new world order. Ultimately, you either have to get rid of football or you have to neuter it. And I think the NFL has been under siege ever since the Susan G. Komen Foundation got into the NFL and made players wear pink for a couple of games each month, right? So the thing that I – here's what I think is going to happen – there's going to be an issue with football and gambling because gambling is built in, like you could go to ESPN.com and they've got their own gambling app now. And I feel like that that's going to be at some point a domino that's going to fall. Hey, wait, have you seen the thing real quick? Sorry to interrupt, but have you, I just saw right. a thing about how all the Super Bowls are predicted by the color of the 
Yeah. Those. And that's the two yeah. teams from the color. And it, they, this, I've seen them show it like multiple years in a row. And yeah. like going to yeah. this idea of gambling and everything already pre-set up, right, for who's going to win. Well, you can even see it from like a synchronistic perspective. Like I was able to predict that the Warriors are going to win in 2022. Well, why? Because they have the same colors as Ukraine. And oh, wow. the Rams won the Super Bowl, same colors as Ukraine, right? So some of this stuff is like so on the surface, it's easy. But yeah, based on those colors, I think it's the uh, the Ravens and the 49ers. Like it's the purple and the red. I think that's what it is this year. But I yeah. think they're going to have an issue with football and gambling. And th- there's going to be a shift. They'll keep football, but ultimately it won't be tackle football anymore. It'll be flag football. And um, they just they just applied for flag football to be an Olympic sport. Wow! And, and flag football would become co-ed. We'll have uh, male and female members of the team. So I think I think pro football will go away. I think basketball will stick around because it's a global sport. They're doing everything in their power to elevate soccer and make it more part of the American mainstream. And they really focus on the women's soccer team more than the men <laughs> because. They feel like they could probably get more of a foothold with women um, with that. So I think I think sports are going to change dramatically. And then you have this whole when, um, new immersive world of VR and VR sports. And, you know, so so that's a whole other discussion. But I, I you know, when, when I was younger, and Barry, you probably remember this, like boxing was a big deal. You know, oh, yeah. it was, and now boxing is nothing. You know, you have you have MMA, which is its own breed, but um, yeah, the old sports world is going away. And when you get into Aquarius, you know things change. Everything changes. The whole concept of the team sports changes. It's not just purely men or purely women. You're going to be looking at way more attempts to integrate these sports in a lot of ways. Like look, but would- also, so what's happened to women's sports, as Stacy mentioned in the chat here. With everything with the whole trans thing. That's right. right? Yeah. Yeah. And the- yeah. I mean, I could, it could easily see where, you know, if, if we're still doing this thing the way that we're doing it four or five years down the line, that the NBA would mandate that there would be at least um, uh, two female members on a team and one on the floor at all times. And would those, be trans? would those be trans? Would those be men dressed up as women? It could be. Could be men dressed. It depends on how how you identify, right? Um, but I could easily oh, see that with I could easily see that with the NBA. The NBA is a prime candidate for that kind of inclusion. Everything my coaches uh, instructed us to do as I was a defensive player would elicit a flag in the NFL these days, uh, you know, we were taught, you have to put your head right in the numbers, all that, and all that, all that stuff would draw a flag. I always often say that I believe the transition from a more um, genteel America into the militaristic uh, country that we have now was really ushered in with the, the transition of the national pastime from baseball to football. And even, and I was a baseball player is my favorite, probably best sport. And, uh, but then got seduced into bulking up and being a football player. Um, you know, I always had that animosity, kind of a love hate with football and missed baseball, but went through it cause football is a meal ticket. So, um, yeah. And I think as a nation, it, it was really more than just interesting that, you know, you look up at the fans, Mike and I were just talking about this the other day, uh, the old time baseball game and everybody's up there visiting and, you know, having a good time dressed very nicely. Now you got, you know, big beer belly guys that are you know, painting their bodies and fighting with each other up in the stands with football. So I, I think it's a very clear demarcation of a society going south, but that's just my sports analogy. No, I, no, I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. You know, baseball represents sort of this agrarian period of America, right? right. It's, an agra- it's an agrarian sport. And then football is this interesting kind of transition between agrarianism and urbanism. And basketball is an urban sport. And so football mm-hmm. is kind of the gateway between those two worlds. Um, on serious sports, I talk, you guys might get into this a little bit. 
I talk about the aeons of football, and it starts with the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. Mm. And the Green Bay Packers do represent middle America, right? They're middle America, and it's agrarian. Like, you know, it's an agrarian town, agrarian kind of world. And then you fast forward to the 70s, and the team in the 70s is the Pittsburgh Steelers. And that represents industrialism, right? Steel Town, USA, right? Then you get to the 80s, and they're, I think the Niners, but but the Washington Redskins actually won three Super Bowls during the 1980s. Yeah. So when, when you combine the Niners and the Redskins, you basically have Silicon Valley with the military industrial complex, right? So now we're defining football in a new and different kind of way, right? It's like the rise of the two of those entities together. Uh, then the 90s get really weird and felt like the Cowboys were supposed to, you know, kind of be this team in the 90s, but it, they they start off that way. And then there's this kind of weird scrum in terms of, well, what's going to happen with the 90s? Well, we finally find out what happens in the 90s by the end of the 90s, and it's the New England Patriots. And so for 20 years, the Patriots become, you know, Pax Americana, and, um, you know, bringing democracy to the rest of the world, right? And so it's interesting how football defines the eras of the time that we're in. Mm. And and I guess and you have the look- poor Bills, the poor Bills who could never win the Super Bowl, who were like the Buffalo Bills, right? The Wild West that could never, it was no more. That's right. Yeah. And then there's that, that who is it? Isn't it uh, Harding who gets killed in Buffalo at the World's Fair? Right. Like there's like this weird kind of curse, you know, on the city, you know, with Warren Harding. And, you know, they actually had a basketball team called the Buffalo Braves. And then they lost that basketball team. Uh, Buffalo does feel a little bit like a bit of a cursed city when it comes to sports. Um, But, yeah, you can see the evolution of America through the National Football League. It's kind of interesting because the 2020s seem to be the, um, you know, the time of the Chiefs, right? the time of the chiefs and people don't people think chief is an indian word it's not an indian word uh the chief actually comes from france but it's also connected to this idea of the pontiflex maximus who's also known as as the the uh, the chief pontiff which was rome which was julius caesar he was the pontiflex maximus so maybe the chiefs represent something very very different and not anything tribal. Although it was really interesting that that kid got picked up on that Monday night game and the guy at Deadspin has just been roasted on the spit because he went after a five-year-old kid. I mean, this to me, this is really Aquarian, right? It's like, okay, we're going to focus on this five-year-old kid who's got part of his face black. We're just going to focus on the black part of his face. We're going to go after him. We're going to just, you know, scream from the highest mountain that's institutional racism just so happens the kid's grandfather is a tribal elder. And not only is he a tribal elder, he's very well steeped in law. Right. So to me, this is totally Aquarian. It's like, let's go after the kid. Uh Oh, we picked the wrong kid. <laughs> I, I love it. Right. Now all these guys have the backpedal and walking back and, you know, there could be a lawsuit based on, you know, defaming this poor kid who's actually Native American. I mean, that's the ironic part, right? Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. So, I mean, these are interesting times we're living in. And we'll get some of this, right? We'll we'll see the sideshow. Like, we'll see the circus. And then there's also the other circus, and you know, the quote-unquote, you know, hellscape version of the world that we're living in. And, you know, and, and I think you two would agree upon this. Like, it's really just incumbent upon all of us to get our houses in order, live healthy lives, you know, develop our relationships with God and the universe and, you know, try to do the best we can. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff we just can't control in this world. Right. But you know, we can only control and have influence over what we have influence over. And so I guess, you know, Barry, you know, you, you can talk about this from a health perspective and a biological perspective. And, you know, the body is your house and the body is your temple. And, 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 and Mike, you, you know, you're creating a community and life up there and kind of outside of the urban environment. And, you know, I mean, this is kind of where we're at. This is what, it, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's been a great discussion because it really follows the uh, kind of the parameters of the holistic sciences, which are 
in which you're trained to see the uh, whole through the parts. So as we dissect sports, it's fun and everything, but I think there's uh, more than uh, just a little bit of truth as far as what we've been talking about, because everything is going to follow the same predominant resonance. And of course, that's what astrology is all about to me. It's um, it's uh, form and geometry and function through resonance, which all starts with the sky clock above us. Yep. <laughs> Bingo. Amazing, Robert. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been a, a very fun chat and hopefully uh, gives the audience uh, that is new to astrology a little bit more insight into um, how varied and how um, effective it can be in applying it to so many different things in your life. Uh, it's much more than just what your birth sign is and, <laughs> you know, reading, reading that horoscope stuff. So, um, go please follow Robert on his website at robertphoenix.com. He's got a great YouTube channel. Uh, your Sunday lives are fa fantastic. Um, so please go support Robert. Anything else you'd like to mention to our community that you got coming up? Um, I mean, not really. There's, you know, there's a lot of details. Check out my Astro Weather at uh, eight o'clock your Central Time. Um, I go live for about thirty-five minutes, and I talk about what's going on with the astrology of the day. And I, you know, I pluck somebody out uh, who was born in that day, and I and I look at their chart and kind of do a bit of a narrative on that. And um, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, we're going on a year with Astro Weather now. And I do this one thing called well, well, the Star of the Day, which I just mentioned. And I'm doing personal stars of the day for people. So if you go to my website and go into services, basically it's like a 20 minute rendition of what I do with a celebrity or somebody historical. And uh, people are, are getting those for gifts for themselves or for other people. So that's kind of on the, on the table for the holiday, quote unquote holiday season. But other than that, you know, I just, uh, you know, I, I, I just, you know, wish and pray and, and and affirm that we all, you know, get through this to the best of our ability and to help and assist one another along the way. And uh, sometimes it gets really heated and sometimes I find myself getting polarized and it really helps to kind of step out of that and, you know, ask the question, you know, what can I do? What can I do? How can I be of service? And this is really what Regulus and Virgo is all about. And we become interdependent when we when we go down that path. So again, I want to thank you guys for having me on. And um, I'd love to have both of you on my show at some point as well. Uh, I'd be honored to be there. And uh, this is why we're all doing what we're doing, you know, with uh, your uh, podcast and, and what you're offering the world and what we're doing here. And we meet great people this way all the time that are doing fantastic things all over this place. So uh, it's our way, I think, that we're circling the wagons for what's coming. So we're already finding each other. And uh, it's such a pleasure to find you. And now I can satisfy my guilty pleasure of following sports without having to go to ESPN or something. <laughs> we're here for you, Barry. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, that's serious sports and that's its own channel, uh, as well on YouTube. I'll have all of those links in the show notes below. So please go check that out. Go subscribe to all of Robert's, uh, wonderful content, go support the man. And we appreciate you guys. Uh, remember get outside, get your feet in the dirt, go plant something, go for a hike, go hug a tree, go show mother nature, some love. Uh, Robert was speaking about when we can kind of get a little, Things can get tense and we can get caught up on it. Well, Mother Nature will balance us out in a heartbeat. So go show her some love and we'll see you next Thursday. Same bat time, same bat channel. We have the great Raymond Grace next Thursday. I cannot wait for that chat, Bear. Um, that's going to be another fun one. We're just, uh, just keep lining them up for y'all. So you guys Bye. have a great week and we love you. We'll see you next week. Bye.